Got taters here. It's getting close to tater time. Do you know how I know it's getting close to tater time? Do you remember? You start eating all over a little bit? No, no. There's a certain thing that happens every year that tells me it's either tater time or getting real close. Hmm. And what might that be? We got in trouble with it a little bit last year. Yeah. You remember? No, no. I can't remember what I had for breakfast. So the, um, <laughs> This time of year is when the traveling con men oh, yeah. make the yeah. rounds. Yeah. So you've seen them out? This morning. I'm talking wow. about this morning. Uh, well, the G word what we got in trouble yeah, with. Yeah, we can't say the G word. We have to call them traveling con men. Or I, I guess you'd call them worse things. You can call them some four-letter words. What was the asphalt ones out? This was asphalt guy. Now, last year... It was the same day, two guys, two different guys was going to paint my barn roof. But I got my barn roof painted, so they couldn't really, uh, they uh, they was wanting to think there's a hole there the trash man has created right beside my, uh, my dirt driveway, and they was wanting to uh, fix it. I told him I was good. But you know, that's when you better be getting your tater stuff ready when them folks come around. Yeah, today was a pretty day here, and I tell you, every time, when we've had a pretty good winter, as we've had this year, and we have that first pretty day, you just start itching all over. You get that garden itch, and that's where I'm getting just a little bit. I can tell the first pretty weekend we have, myself along with everybody else is going to be out there just itching all over to get something done in the garden. I've already had people calling. We've had people come by with people placing orders like crazy. You can tell it's on their mind, and it's fixing to be here, and everybody's looking forward to it. Yeah, in anticipation of some of this, it's going to warm up a little bit this week, thankfully. Uh, I, we had a video come out on Tuesday. Me and my buddy Wes from the Naked Hog, he gave me a hand. We was getting some of my cover crops turned in, getting some tarps on those, and uh, just getting things ready. Um, always good to be prepared there. And like I said on that video, this is a great time. Well, it, well, I mean, we got potato plant coming up, but we still about a couple months out planting anything else, warm season wise. This is a great time to be really focused on your weed seed bank. You can you can do some cultivation, you can do some tarping, you can do some things that can really go a long way to making you successful in the spring by focusing on getting that weed seed bank down. It's also that time of the year where you need to be taking that soil sample and checking your pH and making adjustments to it. Because it normally takes two to three months for all that, if you put some lime out for it to activate and do its full meal deal. But it's a good time to be checking all that. You ain't got a whole lot else to do. Send that soil sample off, make sure your pH is in the right spot. That's right. Now, I got, uh, these are the goodies I was harvesting when the the G-Man came out there, mm -hmm. uh, offered me some asphalt work. Some of my emerald crown broccoli here, not the biggest I've ever grown, but they sure do make some pretty heads there. And nice and pretty. We had a video on this about, you know, you, you got to be careful with broccoli. You can't get greedy with it. You let this go too long and then you won't have nothing really worth it. will flower out on you. Yep. So I got some of that. Now I showed these carrots last week, but as promised, I want to do a verify, verifiable blind taste test here blind. to see which one you like better. And I just happen to have something in my pocket right there. Mm -mm. It's one of my sweaty headbands from the gym. Go ahead. Oh, it's for me? Yeah. No, oh. that, that one's actually clean. Oh. I washed it. Oh, I'd have fixed my heart if I'd known I was going to have to do all this. You see anything? I'm always glutton for punishment, ain't I? You blinded? I'm blinded. Okay. So we got four different varieties here. And uh, you want to score these? You just want to say which one you like the best? Or? Oh, it don't matter. Whatever. A, a, a Let's give them a one to five. I should have brought a, I should have brought a grocery store carrot, thrown it in the mix, see if you could pick out which one. Oh, I'm sure I could have. Homegrown. All right, so I've got these written on here so people can out there can see what they are, hopefully. So let's start with this one right here. And these are cleaned. There you go. Oh, I forgot you can't see. Yeah, blinded. Yeah. I am. Go for it. Am I supposed to eat it now? Yeah. yeah. Pretty tasty. We always call that one number one. What's that? Number one's going to get a four. Number one's going to get a four? Okay. Don't eat too much of it. You still got three more you got to eat here. Okay. Well, now carrots is like horses to me. I've never seen the ugly one. Yeah. We got this one right here. 
There you go. Good crunch on there, sound like. Yeah, now that's a three. That's a little less flavor than this one. I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, now we're going to go with this one right here. I hope everybody's keeping up the score. Sometimes I forget. I'm gonna have to double double check that one. Double check that one. That's a three point five. Three and a, a half. Solid three and a half. Three and a half. Okay. All right. Last one here. Ain't full yet, are you? I'm getting there. Last one, and I'll show everybody what the, everybody can see that there. That has a different flavor. A little different. I'm going to go back with three on that one. I'm going to go back and check this one. Make sure that this is the one number one I fixed. That was your favorite? Yeah, I guess you, you got... You're going to yeah. leave room for a five if there's a perfect one out there. There's no such thing as a perfect five. Okay. You can't, that's unattainable. You can't, can't get there. Yeah, I'm going to go with a, this one would be my, my favorite one. Okay. So we got, you can take the uh, mask off. Mm -mm. Right so your favorite, which you said you really liked last week, was this yeah, candy carrot. It is. Uh that's the best tasted one. You're pretty confident on Was that. this the next to the last one? That was the last one. The one that you was said the last one. It different. did have a different flavor profile than that. Noticeably different than that. Yeah, this was your second one, yellow. It went, this was your order here. Envy, yellow, bolero, and purple. Mm -hmm. and I think you went Envy highest. You went, uh, uh, I think, a three on the yellow, three and a half on this one, and I forget what you gave this one here. Three and a half, but it was it was just different. So, uh, so um, Bolero has always been my favorite, like we said last week. That one. I believe the Envy's got a little higher sugar content according to my uh, taste buds. That's a good carrot. That's a yep. fine looking carrot and a good growing carrot. And uh, I don't know, those might be out of stock, but I got some more on the way. What else we got going on? I got some transplants. Uh, my pep most of my peppers have come up. Um, Waiting on, I planted a few uh, heirloom tomatoes, waiting on those to come up. My cool crops, cabbage, stuff like that is up, looking pretty good. Um, we've had a lot of people wanting us to bring back the account feature on the website. Uh, so, I am going to bring it back very subtly though. The, the issue we had in the past, and, and I think this is just a product of having an older customer base who doesn't, order online a whole lot was that people would see that my account button at the very top and then they thought it was like a ho old hardware store you had to, you couldn't just go in there and buy something you had to have an account which is obviously not the case um so we're going to bring back the feature but we're going to put it way down at the bottom of the footer of the page so those people with accounts they'll know where to find it they can access it but those people who don't have one or don't want one it's not going to confuse them whatever um within this account feature i hope to um well just to give you an idea one thing that's going to be neat about it is you'll be able to see all the items that you have wait listed so the wait list feature where something's out of stock you know if you log into your account you can see all the things you're waiting to come back and stop and it'll that's tell good. you okay this is back in stock you can you can get it now if you want to or what's better than that is if you've ordered a particular thing and grew it last year and you, you got a little age on you like me and you forgot what you ordered, but you knew it was good and you want to grow it again, you can go back on there and see what you ordered last year. Somewhat, yeah. At some point. Well, yeah, but it, the thing it's not going to bring in old order data. So it's going to be like starting fresh. Yeah, but I'm talking about like next year if right, I want. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, so once we get it up, you can look at any orders that's been placed since we... Uh, since you've started that account, uh, it won't, we left the old data from the old site kind of gone. Yeah, it's not gone, but it's in. It's, it's hid somewhere. Yeah, it's nestled under a rock. And mold. The other thing we're going to try to add is everybody's wanting this wish list feature. Um, so we're going to have a, a something in there where if you're logged into your account, you can add things to a wish list, 
and uh, you know a lot of people like to go in there and browse they're not ready to order all their seeds yet they just want to kind of start compiling the list that's so, interesting um, we're going to try to add that feature uh, I'll let you know when we get all that done might be another month or so but we are working on it what else? Uh, Let me talk about COVID just a minute. Okay, you know, we know yeah. COVID has spurred its ugly. COVID, COVID is uh, stirring again. We're seeing some delays on some hard goods. We're we're out of stock on some things and uh, bottom trays. Man, it's tough getting some supplies in. It's tough right now. Things in slow motion. Just the economy feels like everything's just moving so slow. Freight's moving slow. Having problem. Uh, you know, vendors having problem getting their stuff together to send to us, and ain't a whole lot you can argue with them about. You know, everybody's in kind of a bad way, mm -hmm. but just uh, starting all over again. I mean, we're seeing things in the economy just like we did last March, everything, and we hadn't seen it up to now. Everything got a lot better, but now everything's slowing back down. Uh, we in pretty good shape on seeds as far as our inventory. Some of those are fixing to slow down as far as what we can get in. I mean, to give you an example, these potatoes right here, we're out of stock on some of these potatoes we're going to go on today. And to be honest with you, the potato guy didn't necessarily send me what I ordered. He just sent me what he wanted to. You can't argue a whole lot with that. I mean, he's just doing the best he can, I guess. But, I mean, that's that's kind of the situation we're in, right? We just take what we can get. I've had a couple of vendors that we normally send POs to, purchase orders to, and I just told them, I said, just send me what you can. And that's what the tater guy did. So we're having some issues keeping up with uh, with some of these taters in stock. Now, if you go to buy a potato and it's out of stock, we may in a couple of weeks have it back in stock. We don't know yet. To be honest with you, we're going to wait till we get them in and uh, and kind of adjust things there. I don't want to be selling a lot of taters that we ain't going to be able to get. So that's the reason we're out of stock on some of these, and we very well may get, get them back in stock. Yeah. But it's kind of a tight market right now. So you can use that wait list feature if you want to. Right. You got, still got some time to plant. Uh, or the email notification. That's, right. The yeah, list. you're right. Um, I got something very special coming at the very end of the show. Mm. Very special coupon. Coupon? Just for a pretty substantial coupon. Just for our show viewers. Uh, kind of like a flash sale almost. But you got to stay tuned in the show to see that. Uh, one more thing. So I'm just going to tease this here. We're not going to get into it a whole lot. But there was an article I saw someone post on Facebook earlier, earlier this week, maybe last week. It was a, it was a, a scientific study done by the University of California, Riverside. Some scientists there at UC Riverside. And this was published in the journal called Trends in Ecology and Evolution. And... This was an article that had explored the idea that modern day varieties, vegetable varieties that we grow and commercial guys grow, do not respond that well or at all to this idea of booming soil biology like a lot of the no-till people promote. That these modern day varieties are more dependent on synthetic fertilizers and not dependent on this natural soil biology. And I, I, I got to read the article a little more. I'm going to download it. It's like 30 bucks, but for the sake of the program, I'm going to download, dig into a little more, let you know what we think. But I thought it was interesting just on the surface because that kind of, we've kind of been saying that for a, a little while. That's why you, these hybrid tomatoes, you don't see them growing in the forest, even if you go drop some seeds out there. Well, the first time that I noticed, and I'm going to use a, a corn, I used to grow the Hickory King about every year. And I noticed that Hickory King, which is an heirloom variety, was a lot more drought resistant than the newer hybrid varieties. So I did see a trend there. I hadn't done any testing on fertility and see how forgiving it is there. But we know some of these super sweets and triple sweets and all that are a little bit finicky. But I have noticed that the uh, the heirlooms can be, certain ones, corn more than any of them, can be more drought resistant. Right. And that's not to say you shouldn't try to take care of your soil and have good soil biology. But it seems that more the modern day stuff is more give them, they going to need that extra N, P, and K, whereas your older st varieties and stuff will benefit from that increased soil biology. The modern day stuff, not as much. I'll dig into it a little bit more and we can discuss that. That would further. be an interesting conversation to have. Yeah. 
Once I, uh, once I get red on it a little better, we might talk about it on the show. New varieties. Let's go talk about some new varieties real quick before we talk about taters. I'm excited about some of these corn varieties here. Some of these y'all may have heard of, some of you may not have heard of. I'm going to start off with this guy right here. This is a new sweet corn variety we just added called Glacial. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this one before. This one comes highly recommended by the grower. This is the whitest white sweet corn there is and also supposedly the best tasting white sweet corn out there. Hmm. So I dare some of you guys who are hardcore Silver Queen enthusiasts to, to give some of this a try and put it up against it. This is a super sweet variety, uh, but really bright white ears. You can see good little tip feel on there. Um, it's supposed to be the best tasting white corn variety out there. Now, since this is a super sweet, you got 75 days there. That means this stuff is going to take up and grow fast. What that means is you got to be pretty timely with your fertilizer applications and giving them plenty of water. You ain't got no 100 days to dilly dally around. Um, you got to feed them when they need it and kind of pump it to them. But uh, 75 days, that's, that's pretty quick. Yeah, but it is quick. Guys up north, that'd be a good variety to them pick. Mm -hmm. Then we got the old G90 here, which a lot of people have been asking for. It's a favorite. It's, it's one of those SU or standard varieties like your Silver Queen is. It's the bicolor one. So the old sweet G90 here. Um, I don't know uh, where, I don't know, uh, several places carry this, but we got it here with 95% germ. Really good. Uh, sweet you, corn. you go on any gardening forums, you hear a lot of people talk about G90 corn. People rave about it. People yep. rave about it. Then this one here is one that I hear from a lot of market farmers and what I would call not not large scale corn growers, but you know you got your backyard serious corn fella, kind of like your Andy Webbs out there, mm -hmm. and a lot of those that are in our group are really, really fond of this serendipity here. I've heard some really, really good things about it. They say it's one of the best. They said it's a triple sweet. Um, so it has the super sweet kernels and some of the SE kernels, but I've heard awesome things about that. And it's a yellow corn. It's a yeah. uh, bi color. Yep. In fact, I'm Andy Webb's gonna grow some of that. Oh, course. is it? Yeah, yeah. The last corn here, and this is interesting fact about here, this was one of the, or if not, there's some debate out there whether it was actually the first, but one of the, or if not the first ever SE variety that was developed. And it's still around today, just candy corn. We got a lot of people in our row by row group on Facebook that likes growing this one too, so. How can you it. not like candy corn? That just sounds good. Yep. And we were talking about carrots. And we've got our overwintered carrots that are starting to come in now. <clears throat> but you can also, this is also the perfect time to plant another round. If you miss the overwintered, you know, carrots, this would be the time to get some going. Yep, it um, would. Uh, or if you want another round or want to try some of these new varieties, I've got two of them right here. <clears throat> this one here is called Hercules, a big strong carrot. Mm. So... Hercules is a Chantenay type, so it makes the short, stubbier carrots that are for harder soils. And this one right here is supposed to be the perfect one for rocky, hard, dirt. Clay type soils. Where it's tough to grow yep. carrots in. This Hercules is strong enough to get down there and make a decent sized carrot. Mm. And then we've got this one here, which is pretty highly regarded for its eating quality. This is a more imperator type, so this makes a long, slender carrot, and it's called Olympus. Olympus and Hercules. I might grow some of the Olympus and uh, compare them to that MVC, see what we think there. Now, you folks that are new to growing carrots, a couple of little quick tips there. Plant them thick, keep them wet. Yeah, I got a few uh, tutorials out there on the web. Um, my buddy Jason at Cog Hill, has, uh, he, he, he did good watching them. Boy, he's got a fine look of standard carrots. Mm -mm. All right, tater time, tater time. We've got how many varieties of taters we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten varieties of taters, and like I said, some of these may not be in stock right now, but we just want to go through all these. Some of these, I mean, you might not even get to plant. We may run out before we save ourselves some. Yeah. But uh, we want to go through all these ten varieties, talk about tater planting, when to plant, 
how to plant, fertilizer programs, all that good stuff. Uh, let's start off with the varieties. And uh, I always like to cut them open and see what the inside looks like. We should have washed them so you can see the outside a little better. So with potatoes, you kind of got three categories uh, that, or, or one way to categorize them is based on their maturity date. You've got early maturing potatoes, mid maturing potatoes, and late maturing potatoes. And there's some that are kind of in the early to mid range, some mid to late. And the maturity dates, as with anything we grow, is pretty relative. If it gets hot real quick in spring, it's going to speed that puppy up. So I kind of want to go through them here, talking about the early maturity ones, mid-maturity, and late maturity. So the early maturity ones, on average, you're going to be looking at 85 days or so. And now why is this maturity date important? Well, for me, it, it I don't... Uh, I don't like to have to go out there and dig 10 rows of taters at a time or how many ever rows I, go, I grow. So I like to grow some early ones, some mid ones, and some late ones. You get them early ones out of the ground first, wait another week or so, dig your mid ones, wait another week or so, dig your late ones. Makes a good little, they don't all come in and have to dig them all at the same time. Right. I normally let my vines die back and I've been doing it long enough I can tell when those di vines die back to a certain level it's time to get out there and get some dirt or slinging. Yep. I'll let you be the, the tater opener there. So let's start off with the early maturity varieties and these are going to be coming in around 85 days. So the first one we got our red Norland. And that's actually just good old red tater right there. Now what people call new potatoes. As for the red skin potatoes this red northern is better suited for the south than any other variety. Yep, it, it, it outperforms the Pontiacs in our yep. testing. Um, so you got your red tater right there. It's not normally a one of the larger potatoes out there, it's just a medium sized potato. Right. Then we got this old heirloom variety called the Irish Cobbler. And I've never grown the old Irish Cobbler before, but I may give her a shot this year. So that's a more white potato. Well, cream inside. colored, I guess you yeah. call it cream colored. It's not white. That'd be a white. good frying tater right there. Mm -hmm. Real good frying tater. So that's the early maturity tater as well. Then we got our Viking potato. Now this Viking potato makes a big old tater. Big old tater. Yep. So it kind of looks like the red northern on the inside, but a, a much bigger tater. Much bigger potato, yeah. And I think that's more of a kind of improved variety of red tater so to say then we got uh two blue or purple colored tater we got adirondack blue man look at there mm. and then we got I just, that's just amazing that's a pretty one and then we got the purple majesty here which is uh i believe is a um was created by mixing the all blue with something else and that one looks a little darker I don't know. They're pretty Can't close. tell much difference. Really. Pretty close. Maybe a little smaller potato than that one. Purple mash is known for it. it uh, you got to grow you a few purple potatoes. So them. those are all the early ones. Your Red Norlin, your um, Irish Cobbler, Viking, Blue, and Purple Majesty. Now we get into our mid-maturity ones. And uh, the this, most popular one, we sell more of these than any of them. Is the Yukon go? Uh oh. Uh oh. A worm. Not a worm, a hollow heart. A hollow heart. A little hollow heart in there. They still plant that. Oh, yeah, they still plant. As we say, this one right here's got the butter already built in. Nice, sweet flesh here. These, these are my favorite baking potatoes right here. They are good. I'm talking about baking them and, and squish them up, eat them with skin on there. That's what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't ever peel any tater. I always eat the skin on it. I don't. I don't believe in peeling anything, really. Uh, now I, this I is one of the watermelon rinds. No, it ain't the watermelon yeah. rinds. This is the uh, most of these Yukon Golds are bigger than this one here. Yeah, so it's a decent sized potato. Yeah, pretty good sized potato. Now the real big one is one you got coming up next. This old Kennebec. Mm-hmm. That's your French fry. French yep. fry potatoes. Mm -hmm. French fry. Mm-hmm. That's the one. You, if you got you one of them little units. Where you, you uh, like they use it at the restaurants, you know? Yep. Pull down and make your French fried taters with yep. some big ones there. Yeah. French fingerling. Now, this is one of them boutique potatoes, I call it. 
Now, flavor-wise, I grew some of them last year and some of this next one. Taste-wise, them right there is hard. To yeah, eat. I like them too. They uh, are what we call gourmet taters. Yep. Look at the inside. It has that red, nice red modeling inside there. Too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good roasted potato. Those are some of them that growed up poor. We didn't even know them types no, of taters. No, no, no. You don't know. You have to go to a pretty fancy restaurant yeah. to find some of them. Yep. But now we got them so you can grow them in your backyard. Grow your own. This is a real good one here. Look at the yellow on the inside. Yeah, Australian, Chris. That's a nice roasted Austrian, potato. Austrian, I think. Austrian, yeah, Australian. No, Australian or something other. It's a nice roasted potato also. Doesn't lend itself to frying real good because of the shape of the potato, but it's great to roast, smash, put some butter on. Yeah, you can put them, especially mm -hmm. the small ones, put them whole on a baking sheet. and uh, So those are mid-maturities, a Yukon or Kennebec. French Fringling and an Austrian Crescent. And then the one late maturity we've got here is the old German Butterball. And this is the yellowish one. Ooh, ain't it there? Look at there. If that's a yellowish one. Yellowish is a word, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the yellowish one. I really like that one. That one's going to come in later than all of them. Uh, that'd be the last one you dig right there. Those are uh, fine, fine taters. To so I always have to plant me a, a little bit of blue tater, and I think this year I'm gonna plant me some German butter balls and Yukon golds, and probably grow me some French fingerlings. Yeah, you like to have a good little variety for, you know, maybe four varieties or so. I get carried away now or sometimes. I have planted just about that many varieties. Well, it's hard when you're cutting up taters, you don't realize how much taters you don't cut up until you just, you sit there, you watching ball game, watching something, cutting up taters. Next thing you know, you got a big old satchel full of taters cut up and then you get out there planting and you plant one row, two rows, three rows, and you still got half a bucket left. Shoot, let me go make me another fur. Huh? Yeah, and it's contagious when you start planting. You just mean you think you're going to plant you some more. Next thing you know, you got enough to feed the whole community. Then you save, you save a few, and you have folks like Old Man Herod coming around and yeah. snipe you, uh, cut up taters. Right. But they're fun to grow. I suggest everybody that's new to gardening, Seriously consider growing you some potatoes this year. I think you'll enjoy it. It's one of those things that you plant early, it comes off early. It's not going to get in the way of your tomatoes and your peppers and things like that and give you some good groceries to eat while you're waiting on those tomatoes and peppers and corn to come in. We'll do a video on this a little more in depth, but um, you don't have to cut up your taters when you plant them. They'll go a lot further. If no, I'd say you do. You'd say. Yeah, yeah. You go straight to jail if you don't cut your taters <laughs> up. Anybody that's that wasteful, I just don't, I don't want to deal with If you plant them. a whole tater, you're going to get more taters than you're going to get a bunch of little taters. If you plant the pieces and uh, split up the eyes there, just one to two eyes per piece, you won't get as much overcrowding and you'll make bigger taters that way. And uh, and you won't have nobody making fun of you. Don't, y'all be, all, don't, I'd hate somebody post a picture on the road by road group of planting whole taters. I'd have a hard time. Yeah, don't do that. They might have, they, we might have suspended. mm, -mm. Anyway, cut your taters up, make them go further. You'll grow better potatoes and you'll feel better because you didn't waste no taters. That's right. When are we going to plant taters? That's what everybody wants to know. When are we going to plant these taters? So, you'll see different things out there. I strongly disagree with the Almanac's recommendation on this. So they say plant them after your last frost date. Um, well, I recommend planting them is about two weeks before your last frost date. Yeah, and just like the variants of when you're going to get that last frost date, you got a little bit of variance there when you can plant right. these potatoes. It's not come set on. in stone. you got to get Now, some people, I've heard some people north of us, uh, St. Patrick's Day, they got to get them in. Some people around here are religious about planting them on Valentine's Day, and, and that is a great thing to do on Valentine's Day. Absolutely. Uh, women absolutely go crazy. For uh for planting taters on Valentine's. Yeah, a lot of times you may you may get up and think she's gonna say, boy, I, I wish you'd carried me out to a nice restaurant last night, but I sure am glad we're gonna plant taters today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A uh, 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 sack of seed taters will 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 just forget about the roses, wine, forget about the wine, forget yeah. about the all. The, yeah, buy her some seed potatoes. And make a scheduled date for that Valentine's Day get, get, and plant them, and I guarantee you yep. she'll love you the rest of your life. Home, home run. run. Yep. Home run every day. So two weeks before your last frost date is, is 
when you want to plant them but there's a window there there's about a two week window for us that window is anywhere from mid-february to the end of february even the first week of march really it also has an effect how much rainfall you're having during this period i mean they've been situations where we've had a really wet middle of february and we had to wait to the end of february before we could get out there and yeah. moisture wise and get them planted i got something for that I, i'm going to tell you later but I've always planted mine at the end of February, and they've always done well. I don't get in no big hurry planting my potatoes. Yeah. I've known some folks that get in a hurry and ends up biting them in the mm -hmm. you know where. They don't listen very well. Two, week, two weeks before your last frost date. Let's go through here the general last frost dates, average last frost dates for the zones so people can get an idea when they want to plant. You got zone 10 way down there in Florida uh, or maybe even South Texas where they don't get any freezes. Uh, so they probably already planted, I would imagine. You got zone nine, they're gonna get their last frost in mid to late February. So they're starting to plant about right now, or we'll be planting in the next couple weeks in zone nine. Yeah. Uh, you got zone eight where we are, we're gonna get our last frost in early to mid March. Um, so we wanna plant, you know, late, Fe you know, mid to late February is gonna be good for us. You zone seven, they're going to get their last frost in mid to late March. So they're going to be looking at early March for planting. I uh, mean early April, excuse me. No, early March. Oh, yeah, early March, yeah. Now, zone 6, they're going to get their last frost early to mid-April, usually, which is going to put them planting at the end of March. Right. Zone 5, they're going to get their last frost in mid to late April, which is going to put them planting at the beginning of April. And then zone four, where they probably got snow on the ground right now, they're getting their last frost in early to mid-May, so they're going to be planting in late April. So or first of May. Right. So hopefully that gives you kind of an idea uh, on all the zones there. Let's talk about fertilization on taters. Taters are probably one of the easiest fertilizer programs to wrap your head around, in my opinion. It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, so I... I researched several sources here and came up with the best kind of bullet down simple easy program for home gardeners let's not make this super complicated you'll find some stuff that says just give them some phosphorus or this and that but it's hard to find just one source of the the three major nutrients there so we're going to break it down for you we always give our potatoes a a balanced fertilizer for the most part it doesn't have to be exact the same number, but something pretty close. Yeah. Um, so uh, 20, 20, 20, a 10, 10, 10, you'll see 13, 13, 13s. We got our, um, I didn't bring one, our complete organic fertilizer, which I think is 5, 4, 3. So what you need for potatoes is 5 pounds of balanced nutrients per 1,000 square feet. Now, now when you say it's fertilizer. You're talking about five pounds of complete fertilizer. Yeah, so five pounds of nitrogen, five pounds of phosphorus, five pounds of potassium per 1,000 square feet. Now, let's assume, like my plots are, that uh, you don't do a three-foot row spacing and uh, you, mine, I've got 30-foot rows. I can fit 10 rows in 1,000 square feet, so forth. If I break that down per row, I'm looking at half a pound of actual nitrogen per 30 foot row. 30 foot row is pretty easy for most people to kind of wrap the head around. You can take their measurements and kind of uh, figure out what you need. So what does that actually mean for how much fertilizer you need? Like I said, I didn't bring a bag of our complete organic fertilizer. I'm probably going to use a little bit of that on mine. For a 30 foot row, for the whole tater growing process, you'll need a 10 pound bag of that complete organic fertilizer. That's gonna give you all your nutrient needs. Now for, if you're going with something like this 20-20-20 here, doing the water soluble way, you'll need 2.5 pounds of this per 30 foot row. And that's for the whole deal now. You wanna spoon feed that out there. Yeah, you're gonna split this up. With taters, you wanna put about half of that two and a half pounds of this or 10 pounds of the organic stuff, half of it down at planting. And then what I saw the recommendation, they, they called it sprinkler time. So whenever those plants get up and they start 
<coughs> having some water needs or a, a, another good time to kind of measure by is when they need to be healed that first time so before planting and at the first healing is a good time to put your fertilizer out now i normally don't use drip tape on taters no i i don't uh either I so in, water mine. injecting them is really not an option for me <coughs> but it can be done but it can be done so what i do is i put me some in my one gallon sprayer if i need to juice them up a little bit and run down through there and shoot it out right there in the system mm -hmm. yeah yeah. I try not to get down on the leaves, but if you do, it's okay. But I shoot it right there at the root system, and I'll do that pretty regular. So for every 30 feet of row, two and a half pounds of this split into two applications, or 10 pounds of our complete organic fertilizer split into two applications. Don't get much simpler than that. Yep. <coughs> All right. Some tips and tricks here. Healing taters. You got to heal you taters. Healing. Why do we heal our taters? We heal our taters because we like healing potatoes. Uh, some lady on, uh, I think it was an old Facebook or YouTube video this week, asked why we why we heal our taters. And I said, man, I, I could go on and on about this. But, yep. You know, weed suppression, um, you encourage better root development. And one of the main things is you keep the sun from getting to these puppies. They'll turn green if they get exposed to the sun. You want to keep them nice and covered up. Some people will say that these fast-growing Taters, these early maturity ones, don't really require healing and don't benefit from it. But uh, if you get a hard rain, it's going to expose some of these to the sun. Yeah, you got a bone in it. I'll tell you something else that you can do. If you plant them, and this happens just about every year, you plant them and they come up and they're nice and pretty, about yay big. And the weatherman says you got a hard freeze coming this way. See, we, all, uh -oh. we always panic. But I've done this several times. You can take your high art wheel hoe, go out there and heal them and cover them up with dirt. And that'll keep that frost from settling on them. And they'll be just fine and they'll come right back so out. It warms up there. Crawl, right, yep, up through crawl there. right through there. It's hard to put too much of healing on a potato. Yep. Yep. So you can cover them. If you plant too early and they come up and then all of a sudden, whoop, we're getting a late frost. Just put some dirt on top of them. Yep. Some people put some mulch on top of them. That works too, but the dirt's easier for me to just go out there and take my wheel hoe and heal them up and be done with it. Now, what do you do when it, this time of year, it ain't as warm, your soil don't dry as fast, and it's just too wet to plant taters, but you know it's time to plant taters. And you know if you plant taters when it's too wet, these rascals is going to rot in the dirt. So what do you do? Well, my buddy Tom Matthews enlightened me to this last year, and this works like a charm. Use your tarp. I got a tarp. I got two tarps out right now on some of my plots. Excuse me, helping to break down some cover crops, but also serving the purpose of I ain't got to worry about if they're too wet to plant or not. So you just peel it back and you're ready to plant. Yeah, get it ready. Get it ready. You might have to peel it back, put a little water on it here and there just to keep it from getting hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. But, but uh, what does that mean? It just means and it just, your ions get messed up in there and it, it won't mm -hmm. absorb any water. But anyway, I don't want to be hydrophobic. Put your tarp on there uh, and that just keep it right. Keep all that rain from getting on there and you'll be ready to go. Come Saturday when it's pretty, you want to go out there and get her done, just pull your tarp back and you're ready. You're ready. You're, yep. you're ready. And if you're doing it on Valentine's Day, you have your old lady out there helping you. Your wife. Wife. Or your sweetheart. Sweet thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, the last thing is, and this has to do with when you're done with taters, once you dig them. This is the case with all nightshades, but especially with taters. Don't be leaving your tater plants in your plot. Don't be tilling them into the soil. Get them out of there. Put them in that compost bin we talked about. Save, yeah. Save you some headache down the road. All right. Got any more questions about taters? Put those in the comments below and we'll try to answer them for you. We got some good questions here from last week's show. Yep. First one is from Hondo Smith and they said, love the show as always. How do you fertilize your carrots? So this is interesting. <coughs> you see some different things out there on this. Um, because it's a root crop, initially a lot of people think, okay, well I shouldn't give them as much nitrogen. I should really focus on the phosphorus and potassium to get the nice big roots, but I'd say not so fast. So I don't really try to go heavy on the P and K. I just make sure I give them as much as I do the nitrogen. So 
I feed them pretty much the same thing I feed the majority of stuff in the garden, and that's this 20, 20, 20 in the micro boost, and we inject it on them double rows. Some people say, oh, you don't want to give them too much nitrogen because you're going to make all top. I like a nice, strong carrot top because the la what really bothers me is when I go out there and pull some carrots and it, it breaks, off. breaks off, and mm -hmm. i got to go get the digging for it and go scratching around. It's a lot easier. If I can just pull them out of the ground. So I want some nice, big, strong carrot tops in addition to the roots. So I believe in giving them something balanced and then that little little boost always helps. Hmm. From the carrot name. man himself. From the carrot man himself. Number two is from Adam Weber or Weber. It says great video. He didn't know what PMR meant for pumpkins until we talked about it last week. Are we still working on a microgreen line? PMR is powder mildew resistance, and when we see certain crops out there that are susceptible to powder mildew, susceptible. and the breeders over a period of time have bred things to counteract that. Squash, cucumbers, pumpkins are the three main ones come to mind. Yeah. And uh, they, they've developed and bred to have these powder mildew resistant ones, and they work really good. Uh, planting early in the spring is not quite as important as later in your year. Your powder mildew seems to be worse. So I always recommend if you're planting a late crop or a fall crop, you definitely want to make sure to keep an eye on that powder mildew. Plant those resistant varieties and keep them sprayed because it is going to pop up and bite you. Microgreens, yes, we're working on some microgreens. I've been working on them for a while. We got some great things coming there. Timing's a little off. We still got some, uh, we got some issues to work out. But within the next few months, you're gonna be uh, seeing an incredible product line being launched. Yeah, once our new building gets here, we can uh, we'll have some room for some microgreens. All right, the next question comes from the Loose Monkey Backyard Garden. That's a heck of a name for it. Is state, yeah. Loose monkey. Question, do you adjust or change your watering schedule during cool weather versus warm weather? Well, I sure we do. Certainly do. Uh, this this cooler than normal winter we've been having, I haven't really had to water a lot. We've gotten a lot of rain and it, by the time it dries up, it's been raining again. I've been, water, really the only times I've been watering the last few weeks is when I want to sneak in a little fertilization in there uh besides that really hadn't ran the drip tape a whole lot the onions required a little more but dur during the warm weather <clears throat> when we don't get any rain and it's warm around here i'm watering almost everything every other day um during the cool season you're looking at maybe once or twice a week uh so right. i definitely definitely dial it back uh i do like to give them water uh even if it doesn't look, you know, super, super dry, I still like to feed them. Uh, they seem to like that. Yep. Number four is from K-E. You get any ideas on that one? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go with that. that that's K beyond my pay grade right there. K, maybe it's K-A. Um, I plan on planting corn for the first time this year. She's got some 20-20-20 and some Chilean nitrate. Is there a reason to use one over the other? Yes, they are. Corn loves nitrogen, so I always use a balanced fertilizer and I alternate with the nitrogen source. Now, here's my take on that. Corn loves organic nitrogen, Chilean nitrate, and it also loves ammonia sulfate. Calcium nitrate is a straight nitrogen source, but I save that one for my nightshades. So I love to alternate my 20-20-20 with either a uh, Chilean nitrate or ammonia sulfate either one of those. And it gives that corn the nitrogen. It needs, it needs a lot of nitrogen. Cabbage, some of your greens do as well, but especially corn. Corn loves that nitrogen. you got to hit it to make it pop, make it grow off, and they got a nice pretty stalk to support that big old ear of corn that you're going to grow. Um, and a side note on that, if you give it too much of the balanced stuff, it's not going to need that much, as much phosphorus and potassium, and you may end up kind of overloading the soil. Yeah, you don't want to do that. We're a quick thing. What's that? I just remembered. This this glacial sweet corn I mentioned earlier. I had a lady, I don't remember her name. I've had several people say this. They live in a neighborhood or wherever where they don't really let them have tall plants for some reason. And there's several people ask me, I want a shorter corn. Because hmm. uh, evidently the neighbors, everybody fusses if you get out and grow big old corn stalks. 
Anyway, this glacial sweet corn is only supposed to get about six foot tall, uh, whereas most of the others uh, get on up there seven yep. eight foot. So just thought I'd throw that out there. All right, so number five is for both of us, and a Gator Pixel Doctor Repair. Hmm. He says, what advice would you say to yourself 15 years ago about gardening? You want me to go first? Yeah, I want to hear what you'd say about 15 years ago about gardening. Well, I was I was in school 15 years ago. So I'd well, what would you say about gardening 15 years ago? Kind of modify the question yeah. a little bit. Uh, I would say, what would you say when you were, uh, what would you tell somebody that was a beginner gardener? I'm going to modify the question. <laughs> so what, what I would say is um, take chances with your planting times. Take risks. Try to plant stuff uh, sooner or later than you might think you can. And that's really how you learn more about the plants and how they respond to hotter than normal or cooler than normal things. So take chances with your planting times. Uh, experiment with new varieties. You don't know how many times I see, especially as people around, we get a lot of it around here, older folks who, man, they've just grown Silver Queen or whatever for 30 years. That's all they grow, all they ever grow. And they're just missing out, in my opinion, on a lot of good varieties, things to try uh, out there. So take I mean, experiment with new varieties, new crops you've never grown. We're gonna be adding some parsnip soon. Can't wait to try those. And also experiment with new techniques. Try different things. If you've never tried drip irrigation, give that a try. Lots of gardening techniques out there. There's not one that works for everybody, but try the techniques and that way you know at least this is why this one works for me. This is why this technique doesn't work for me. You don't ever know until you try. Yep, good advice. What I would say is start small. It's a common occurrence. People go out there and get all juiced up juiced. and they plant way more than what they can tend to. And especially if you're a beginner gardener, there's going to be some learning curve there. So start small, you know, get some things under your belt, understand how some things grow, understand what you like to grow, what you're going to eat. There's no need to grow nothing that you don't like. But uh, start small, tend to those plants, and then next year gradually increase it and don't go out there and overdo it because what's going to happen is you're going to get discouraged. You're going to get... Um, you're going to you're going to lose the battle with some of the pests and the weeds and it's going to get really upsetting to you and you're going to want to give up start small learn how to control all that and how to be successful then gradually make your garden bigger to the size you need it to be to feed your family yeah good, good advice here last thing as promised i was going to give a little keep on here so we got a little extra elephant garlic left in the back there and Although we plant this stuff in the fall, I have planted as late as this time of year, and you'll still make a head. Maybe not quite as big as you'll make in the fall, but you'll still make good elephant garlic, yep. good to eat. And it's also, you know, if you didn't get any the, in the fall, you can still grow you out some nice seed stock for next year. So, big fire sale on elephant garlic here, 35% off. 35%? 35% Say what you? off elephant garlic, whether you get one pounds, five pounds, or 10 pounds. 35% off. So you add, just add it to the cart on the website. And when you get to the checkout page, there's a box you enter a coupon code. The coupon code is Big Garlic. All one word, all lowercase. B I G G A R L I C. Now, since this has been in our warehouse for a month or so, still very viable as far as the seed, but this may not feel like five pounds. But we put the approximate clove count on the website you get about eight cloves per pound. Right. So the clove count's still gonna be good. They do lose a little bit of weight to moisture, so you may order five pounds and feel this and say, that don't quite feel like five pounds. But I promise you, you're getting your money's worth on the cloves. Yep. Especially with that 35% discount. 35%, really good deal. Big garlic. And this is just, just for our wonderful. And how long is this coupon gonna be good for? Just for our wonderful row by row viewers. And this is going to expire at midnight on Friday night. So 12 a.m. Eastern Friday, it's over with. Boom. So you got to act fast. Want to reward those people who always tune in and watch the show when it yep. airs or, you know, watch it at work the day after. Big deal on elephant garlic, so take advantage of that while it lasts uh, before we run. I'm sure we'll probably run out after All right. this deal. All right. That's going to do it for us tonight. Hope everybody enjoyed the show. 
If you did, give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Ring the bell so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy it, we've got a couple tater videos right here. I Taters. think you really like to see get you good and fired up for tater planting time. Yeah. Take we'll see care. See you guys next week.